Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, PSCNG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT, makes a difference in our students' futures. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, moving the region through air, land, rail, and sea. Suez, North America, dedicated to shaping a sustainable environment. Gibbons, PC. University Hospital. And by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ. And by ROINJ. Informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are. There is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Uh, it's a very special edition of One on One. Let me set this up for you. This is part of an ongoing series of programs that um, is not any sort of one-off or, hey, we did a show on that. It's called Confronting Racism. And there are two very special guests who will confront institutional, systemic, ongoing, way too long, we've had enough. Um, and they are, first, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. She is the first a statewide elected African-American in the state of New Jersey. She's the former Speaker of the House, Speaker of the Assembly, the only African-American woman to hold that role. She is powerful. She's influential. She's important. Her experience dealing with politicians, disproportionately uh, white, middle-aged, and older men, and her ability to navigate those realities and those challenges, she shares. She talks about her experiences, and she talks about what we need to do from a public policy point of view, what we need to do in terms of our laws, what we need to do in terms of police-minority relations. Sheila Oliver is, in so many ways, one of the most significant figures, not just in this state, but in this nation. Her voice needs to be heard, and you cannot confront the issues of racism without speaking directly to someone like our lieutenant governor in New Jersey, Sheila Oliver. On the second half of this program, Akilah Sherrills, he heads up an organization called the North Community Street Team. Why is that important? Because no matter when you're seeing this, on May 30th, there was a protest in Newark. And while there were other places around the nation, other cities, other communities, where those protests were not always so peaceful, and President Trump and other like, others like to point to some of the things that happened, the looting and the violence, not in Newark, not on the May 30th, and a lot of that was because of Akilah Sherrills, working directly with Mayor Roz Baraka, working directly with the head of public safety, Anthony Ambrose, and the police department, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. 12,000 people gathered in Newark to fight against racial and social injustice. Black Lives Matter very directly involved. This was not just a peaceful protest, but a powerful protest. You cannot confront racism. You cannot talk about racism. With Akilah, we also talk about why it's so difficult to talk about race for so many, and why this moment is the moment, if we're ever going to make any real change, changes, plural, now is the time. So without further ado, on the front end, you're going to see Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. On the back end, Akilah Sherrills. Two very important conversations as we all together, arm in arm, try to confront racism. Welcome to Uncut. I'm Steve Adubato. A series of, this is a series of conversations with people who are making a difference in our lives every day in government, in the not-for-profit sector, in business, and the university community. We're honored to be joined by the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of New Jersey, Sheila Oliver. Um, Sheila, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Lieutenant Governor, let me ask you this. We, had, we did a previous conversation for public broadcasting on um, where we are post-COVID, or not, I shouldn't say post-COVID, in the midst of COVID, but help us on this. We're taping this in mid-June. The disproportionate impact 
of COVID-19 on people, on black and brown people. What is that about? I think it's a number of things. And of course, we've been examining this uh, you know, with our Department of Health and experts that have been working with us. Um, for one thing, um, many people in the black community already had pre-existing conditions, diabetes, heart disease, a um, number of different underlying conditions. Access to health care, even though we've kind of gotten the ACA in place where people can you know, go in a health exchange and, and get low cost uh, health insurance, many people don't even have that. So what you find in the African-American community for people who are not insured, they don't visit doctors regularly, so they don't know what condition they are in. We've learned that this virus um, can, if you have a compromised system, if you have any of these underlying conditions, uh, COVID's gonna come right in as a welcome visitor. And I think that is the top reason. The second, and you know, one of our dear friends uh, shared this with me, Janine LaRue. She called me up one day. She's the best, absolutely the best. And she hey, said- By the way, check out uh, Janine LaRue, her Facebook regular posts are absolutely terrific. Just check that out. I'm sorry that I shouldn't have plugged, but she's our friend, go ahead. But Janine said to me one day, Sheila, do you realize that people who live uh, in the Trenton Housing Authority properties, um, it's no more than 600 square feet. And there may be a mother, there may be three children, there may be two, two uh, grandchildren. But Janine and I engaged in a conversation that um, in low and moderate income families, they generally are living in cramped quarters. And that is why we were all concerned if there were adult children in a household who were going in and out, going to work, continuing to work, and coming home to that elderly grandmother. But I think that our living situations um, are, are contribute to the spread of the COVID as well. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, let me ask you this. Um, in our previous conversation, we talked a little bit about institutional racism, racism, confronting it. But this is a different twist on it. Why do you think it is so difficult for so many? Listen, listen Sheila Oliver is from Essex County. Um, I'm from Essex County. We're from neighboring towns. We've known each other for a long time. Let's just say this. I'm not going to stereotype, but I'll do the best I can in describing this. There are some folks in certain parts of Essex County, disproportionately white, middle class, upper middle class, who, who are my friends, who are your friends, who, let's just say, are not as sensitive and, 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 let, and not as um, willing to look at their own contribution to racism or their own racist feelings. All of us struggle with that. But here's the question. For some of them, I find it, and I imagine you would find it, particularly difficult to talk honestly about race, race relations, racism. Because there are many who say, trust me, there's a question here. We already, quote, dealt with that. But then you see George Floyd. You see so many cases after that. The question is this. Is it as hard to talk honestly about racism as it appears to me to be? Uh, absolutely, Steve. It is a difficult conversation. And, you know, being an African-American, I think we need to have uh, honest conversations amongst ourselves because we are racist, too. What do you mean by that? That African-Americans also hold stereotypical view of Caucasians, of Asians, of uh, people that come from African nations, people that come from Caribbean nations. Um, I think racism is broader than just black versus white in the United States. And I attribute it all to lack of experience. So yes, I, I, I like you, Essex County, I have friends in, in you know, the western part of the county, but they know me, I know them, I've had history with them, I've worked with them, and I think what the issue gets to be, we continue to have such segregated communities in our state, but it has to do with the unequal distribution of wealth. That's really what it has to do with. You know, when, when the lieutenant governor talks about segregated communities, communities it's interesting. Essex County is an incredibly diverse county, but 
people are segregated. I happen to live in Montclair, born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Montclair is a relatively integrated community, yes. but there are pockets of segregation. Yes. Essex County is a diverse county, but African Americans disproportionately live in Newark, East Orange, Ar uh, Irvington, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. We're sep we don't know each other's experiences. That's correct. Is that part of the reason why it's so hard? It is. And then, Steve, when you think about young people, when they're socialized and, you know, they're going through development, they're in segregated schools. And, you know, when I was running the leaguers in Newark, uh, a, youth a great not-for-profit organization committed to education and, and promoting leadership among young people. Yes. But one of the things I made it a point of was giving experiences, travel experiences within the state and outside of the state to introduce kids that were living in Newark and East Orange and Irvington, the opportunity to see a different kind of life, a different kind of community. There are many urban kids growing up in urban school systems. They've never been to Monmouth County or Ocean County or Salem County, Cumberland. And I think that this creates the divide. As a legislator, I found that to be true because our, our state legislature is built up around regionalism. And when I was a, the speaker, I made a commitment to travel. For the assembly. Yes. I made it my business to travel to all 40 districts, legislative districts. And I got a real education. It made me a better legislator um, because I understood that Salem County is probably the poorest to be found. Everybody thinks it's Newark. Everyone thinks it's Trenton or, you know, it's Camden. Aspen. Camden at the time, but uh, poverty exists in other parts of the state. I always say the Raritan River is the great divide in New Jersey. If you live above it, you know one New Jersey. If you lo live below it, you know another. Final and question. I think that, that contributes to this whole issue of racism. Sorry for interrupting. Final question. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Oliver was, the, uh, was one of the many honorees. Each year, we run a um, a not-for-profit entity called Stand and Deliver for young men and women uh, in urban areas, disproportionately in Newark, teaching communication and leadership skills. It's run by uh, our great leader, Mary Gamba, uh, on our team. And, and every year, the Dr. Martin Luther King Award <clears throat> isn't given, it is earned by someone. And Lieutenant Governor um, was a Dr. King honoree in front of about 400 young people who were at this event. And it causes me to ask this question, since that program is all about leadership. Your philosophy of leading, your paradigm, if you will, of leading, your approach to leading is modeled and shaped by what? The many mentors that I had uh, during my teen years, and uh, I'll start with my family, because my family was, a, was a, you know, now they have hashtag stay woke. Uh, my parents were woke. And so at an early age, um, we had an extended family that was made up of all kinds of people. Uh, my mother's best friend was a Jewish woman from Sheepshead Bay, New York. Um, so I think that the things that I ideologically adopted at an early age contributed to leadership. I also think that um, I'm a baby boomer. And um, I think I developed early a strong work ethic. We often think that young people today don't have a strong work ethic, but I think a strong work ethic contributes to your ability to be a, a good youth leader. And ironically, Mary Birch, who um, was the founder of the Leaguers, of the Leaguers right. she gave me a lesson in 1980 that I have never forgotten. She said to me, Sheila, if you are going to embark on a life of public service, then you must develop an alligator hide. I have never forgotten that. And I developed an alligator hide. The other thing that's important to be a good leader is something I had on a t-shirt uh, from a conference I went to. And it said, leadership is the only ship that doesn't return to port when there's a storm. 
So translate that's that, translate that for us, Lieutenant Governor. The leadership is the only ship that does not re turn return to port when there's a storm. <sighs> and that says what to you? It says to me that um, no matter what is going on on a given day, no matter what obstacles and challenges might be represented, you just persevere and you work through it. It creates a better um, leader in you. And uh, the other thing I think that I learned in a, as a leadership um, characteristic, and I learned this from another person you and I know, Alex Plinio, who was at Prudential. Prudential for many years. Mm -hmm. Alex taught me the concept that win-lose is not a good paradigm. Win-win is a good paradigm. So as in the leadership roles I have had to fulfill, I have often stressed working towards win-win, that everyone walks away from the table with something. Might not be with 100% of what they want, but everyone gains something. And uh, I think these are the things that contribute to someone being a good leader. Uh, on a final note, the other thing you did not mention, <clears throat> Sheila Oliver, is that every day I've known you for 20, 30 years, you've shown people nothing but respect, no matter who they are, where they are, and what their title is or is not. So the just respecting other people and their humanity is part of leadership as well. You honor us by your presence, by your leadership, and by your dedication to the state of New Jersey its citizens, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate always seeing you. Okay. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome to Uncut. I'm Steve Adubato, a series of very important, compelling, and relevant conversations about the most important issues of our time. Uh, by the way, you can find Uncut on my Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channels. Uh, the information will be up there. We are honored to be joined by Akila Sherrills, Director of Newark Community Street Team. Akila, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful, Steve. How are you? Doing all right. Listen, this is part of an ongoing series uh, of Uncut that is simply called Confronting Racism. Yes, sir. What does that mean to you, confronting racism? Confronting racism means to me that, you know, this country was built on, um, you know, on a whole system of, of, of racism, right? Um, and it means unpacking it and understanding the traumatic impact that it's had, not only on um, people of, uh, you know, Native American descent and African American descent, um, but also the people of, of, of European descent, like all of us who live in this country together, who have been impacted by colonization. So it's interesting. There have been all kinds of rallies and protests and in our hometown. I'm born and raised in Newark, Brick City, you know yes. very well, but now live in Montclair. We just had an extraordinary protest and rally under the Black Lives um, Matter banner. Our son, Nick, who's our director, technical director here with us today, was part of a group of talented, committed leaders at Montclair High School, four, five, 6,000 people mm. on May 30th in Newark. Yes, sir. How many people gathered together peacefully with a strong message with the mayor, with the police director, black, white, brown together? How many people? Over 12,000, it was- What, what was the secret of, I'm sorry for interrupting, a little delay. What was the secret to it being not so, not, not only so powerful, but so peaceful and strong? I would first you know, say that it, uh, it was the leadership. We have exceptional leadership in the city of Newark. Um, Mayor Rash J. Baraka is a visionary. Um, you know, Anthony Ambrose, um, you know, who is a longtime resident of the city of Newark. Head of uh, public safety. Absolutely. Um, you know, in their strategy and, you know, um, the, the city's community-based public safety approach, right? Um, the Newark Community Street Team, the West War Victims Outreach Initiative, the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition, um, and residents who were just adamant that um, although we wanted to celebrate um, and, and, you know, share our outrage about the public execution of George Floyd, we also wanted to make sure that this protest um, didn't destroy the city because we're just still literally recovering from the 67 rebellion. Bigger picture, here's the question. 
There are a lot of people around the country, around our state, region, and nation who say now is the time. Now is the time not just to protest, not just to rally, not just to hold hands and say we're together, which all due respect, not everyone is. Mm -hmm. That's right. Time for what? Let's be precise and specific. What do we need to do? Not just to reform, but to overhaul and deal directly and confront That's institutional right. racism. That's right. I think that we're at an inflection point in terms of policing in this country. Uh, far too often, people say public safety and people say police. Um, when we know that police are only one aspect of the public safety process. I mean, you literally can't have public safety without the public, right? Um, a lot of people think that public safety is the absence of violence and crime. Um, but literally, public safety is about the presence of well-being and the infrastructure to support people in their respective healing journey. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I think safety is different things to different people. I mean, you sure know. Sure does. So does law and order mean different things to different people. <laughs> that's right. Um, we know that the history of, of, of law enforcement in this country and policing um, was rooted in, you know, apprehending enslaved people and bringing them back into bondage. Um, and, and honestly, uh, it's still wrought with, um, with, uh, with, with racism and, 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 and implicit bias. Um, so this is an opportunity, it's an inflection point for us to be able to add complementary strategies like the Newark Community Street Team um, in the public safety process. You know, as we're taping this program, it'll be seen later on our PBS uh, affiliates, uh, WNET, NJTV, WHYY, and a series of our programs. Uh, but at the same time, as we're taping this program early in June, President Trump has said many times, and we'll see what he does moving forward, we need to, quote, dominate the streets. You're shaking your head already. It's ridiculous. What does that mean to you? Dominate the streets means to perpetuate systems of structural violence that have allowed black men and, and people of color to be killed with immunity by law enforcement in, in communities across this country. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. And we've seen it play itself out um, in places like New York and, and, and of course, in, uh, in Minneapolis, where George Floyd was, was, was executed, basically. It's, um, it's an old cowboy mentality that um, just, you know, creates harm, you know? So it's interesting. When we think about this, there are a fair number of people who are white and say, okay, I'm listening. Uh, I'm willing to understand my role, but hey, come on, let's not go too far here. Um, and by the way, some of the protesters can get out of hand and have destroyed property and, and have committed crimes. So, hey, come on, let's check ourselves here. None of us advocate or condone those actions. But at your rally, you self-policed. Those police were not in the kind of riot gear that we saw in Washington when the president walked across the street from the White House to go to that church and hold that Bible. It looked like they were being peaceful, but then all hell broke loose. What were you doing and your colleagues to make sure that you self-policed? Well, we've had a six-year strategy going. You know, um, in, in 2014, when the mayor um, formed the Newark Community Street Team, he also commissioned the Safer Newark Council, which utilized data to inform our coordinated victim service, I mean, our coordinated public safety strategy in the city. So we had been working consistently with NPD, with the, the health department, through this public health lens, looking at, you know, the best way of being able to approach you know, public safety and make sure that our, our community is safe. So, you know, when it came time for the, um, the, the protest, the mayor led the protest. That's you right. Know, um, um, Director um, Ambrose pulled all of his cops back to the perimeter. No one was out there in riot gear. And the newer community street team and, and other community partners, we actually were amongst the protesters. We were in plain clothes and also in, in uniform. So we identified ourselves. And everywhere we watched the, the rebel rousers, because there were folks there who were clearly agent provocateurs and That's right. um, who were seeking to create problems. We followed them everywhere they went. And any time they got ready to act out, we jumped right in front of them. And we took rocks out of hands. We stood in front of windows when, you know, one kid attempted to try to break um, the Dunkin' Donuts window with a baseball bat. Most of these folks weren't even from the city. Um, and, and every day after, you know, May 30th, um, we came out, you know, at the request of the mayor or at the, the request of, of Director, Director Ambrose. 
Um, and as folks let us know, we gathered intelligence from Instagram and Facebook and made sure that we showed up and told folks, hey, we're here to protest with you. Right. We're outraged just as well as you are, but we're not going to destroy our city. Kayla, do me a favor. We're going to end this segment of Uncut. As I said, we'll run it several times later. But if you could stay right there, we're going to do a separate interview with you on why it's so hard for us to talk honestly and candidly about race for so many. But this has uh, been Uncut. I'm Steve Adubato. Remember, check us out on my Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube channel, also on our PBS uh, affiliates in New York, New Jersey, and down in the Pennsylvania area. Akila Sherrill's director, Newark Community Street Team. Akila, thank you so much for joining us on Uncut. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, PSCNG, New Jersey Institute of Technology, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Suez North America, Gibbons PC, University Hospital, and by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ and by ROINJ. Every day, nearly 2 million customers across New Jersey rely on PSCNG to provide natural gas. And every day, PSCNG is committed to doing it safely. That includes making sure you know what to do if you smell gas. A natural gas leak smells like rotten eggs. If you suspect a gas leak, leave your home immediately. Get far away, then call 911. Remember, smell, leave, call. Protect the ones you love. Learn more at pscg.com slash gas safety.